Welcome, welcome if this is your first time, and welcome back if you've been with us on previous Tuesdays at lunchtime. A day that has Bach in it is a good day. And last, um, this is our third of these episodes. We started, of course, with principal trumpet Chris Smith. And last week we heard Aaron Dowry playing Bach on the marimba. So now it's wonderful to welcome Ching with us. And that was a beautiful performance. Welcome, Ching. You need to unmute. Mute. Hi. <laughs> there you are. Hi, Martha. Hello, everyone. Thanks so for ha having me. Oh, thank you for being with us. And thank you for sharing that beautiful performance of Bach. Thank you. Um, and what a beautiful home you have. I know that you love interior design, and it certainly is thank evident. Thank you. Um, Go ahead. Well, you know, when I look at um, your resume, it's, as with many of your colleagues, incredibly um, impressive. And beginning as a child in Beijing and studying there and then the Royal, uh, Royal College of Music in London, if I'm not mistaken. Royal Academy. Royal Academy, sorry. Royal Academy of Music. No, it's fine. They're pretty much the same. A lot of people confuse the two anyways well, but it's, I, I, um, and it's a better one the Royal Academy is the better one <laughs> I know I know actually I know that therefore I shouldn't have made that mistake but um, it's uh, you know your your incredible um, pre preparation and leading up to getting this job in 2005 and Ching and I were talking in advance because we um, shared commonality of being in Chicago you were a member of the Civic Orchestra of Chicago which Sounds like it's a community orchestra, but it is nothing like a, 
it is a preparatory orchestra for collegiate and post and, and pre-professional musicians that at a, okay. an incredibly high standard. Um, so we were talking about your Chicago days and um, I know we're going to hear a little Prokofiev from you later, which is no longer modern music, but also in Chicago, you played as part of music now. So, you know, you play a wide range of music. Talk to us a little bit of your own um, experience in that. Hmm. Wow, that's a very good question. Well, I always, well, I get asked a lot when people hear that I'm a violinist, they ask me what kind of violence I am. I always tell them I'm a classical musician and that's my root. That's what I, like Bach, I always go back to Bach. Um, but being San Diego, being surrounded by organizations like um, Art Long for one, uh -huh. um, um, I had many opportunities to play modern music, contemporary music, and I really enjoy that because um, it um, it's another creative way of using our instruments. It uh, makes me a better musician, I feel. Yeah. Well, it's um, incredibly... There, I got that where I wanted. It's incredibly uh, focused, and I think it makes such a rich musician to have that wide, wide range of um, of scope and of interest. Yeah. Well, my my passion um, is still playing in the orchestra. <laughs> it's it might sound strange. Um, it it's just different playing orchestra than play solo it's just very very different and difficult I, I want to say it's almost more difficult I uh, that's one thing I miss um, the most is to um, make music with my 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 colleagues um, so much of what we do is that um, instant reflection in, right, like you hear something, you have to be able to change quickly. It's very challenging and it's it's exciting and fun, very hard to do. So I, I miss that interaction, um, the communication without words. Well, it's one of the reasons we're hoping this orchestra can come together as soon as possible, um, even in small groups when that's possible, just because you and your colleagues have all reflected on this time of kind of isolation is really challenging to um, have that reflex or have that responsiveness to one another. But that's, you know, part of your life. Yes. It's, uh, yeah, it's been my life for 14 years. <laughs> yes, uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, um, I was trying to, I was involved in a um, symphony project, the uh, Vivaldi um, Spring. So I had to record myself and I had to play um, three parts, three violin parts. And I realized how difficult that was um, to play to a computer um, with click tracking your ear. It is, it's very restricted. That's why I realized, oh my God, I really miss playing with a real person next to me. Um, you know, you breathe together. Yeah. At that moment, uh, all you're thinking is music, the music you're making, how you can make the sound better, how you can play together. So when did, how old were you when you played, first played with an orchestra? Hmm. Does school count? <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, I, um, oh, yes, I was in my first year of college in Beijing, oh. the Central Conservatory. I was in the, they call it National Youth Orchestra. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's wonderful. We miss, we miss all of you. Um, let me take some questions from our attendees today. Okay. Um, is this true that you play the ukulele? Uh, uh, it's it's uh, mandolin. 
mandolin. Okay. Yeah, it's very similar. Uh, looks just like ukulele, but it's a it's a mandolin. Yes, and I play a little bit of mandolin. Try <laughs> to be better. But we saw a beautiful piano, and the question is, do you also play piano? Not as well as I like to. Um, I actually started. I started violin first, and a year later, I started um, piano lessons. But my father was uh, very um, strict. He only wanted me to. He wanted me to only focus on one thing. Mm. So yeah, um, I sometimes practice scales on piano, and then father, I use it for teaching a lot of times. Are your parents musicians? Um, they were. They were. They um, they um, my dad was a, a professional musician, Chinese flute. Oh yeah. Yes. Um, but because of um, the Cultural Revolution in China, they were not able to um, have um, that the, the musical career. Mm. They had to go to farms, um, factories. Sure. Sure. Yeah, but they definitely have had big um, influence on me. That's wonderful. Um, everyone always wants to know about the instrument you play and also about the bow you play. So it'd be interesting to hear from you the specialty also of the bow and choosing, choosing the instrument and the bow. How did that happen? <laughs> Oh uh, my God. So I'm probably not the best musician to talk about instruments because I just, I just go with what I hear, what I like. I don't do a lot of research. So the instrument, I um, actually, I found it a long time ago in Chicago. That's before I came to San Diego. Um, it's not a uh, the most healthy instrument because it's very old. It's a um, it's a Viennese instrument um, dated seventeen seventy eight by a Viennese violin maker. But I fell in love with its a uh, warm and dark tone. Um, so without even looking around, I play that violin. I'm sure there were other violins that were better than this one. This has, my violin has a huge crack in the middle, but I didn't care. I almost mm -hmm. liked it, um, that it has little flaw. Um, so two months after I um, got this violin, I won a job with San Diego Symphony. And I still wow. play the instrument. I love it, I love it. Um, then my bow, um, is a French Bazin. It's actually a, a very good French bow maker. Um, yeah, that, that's it. That's what I have. <laughs> and did you get that at the same time? No, not the same time. It's uh, years later. I realized um, with my type of uh, the type of music, uh, the violin I have. Um, I think I knew, I got to know my instrument a little better. Um, and then um, I knew what kind of bow would work better with the instrument. Um, yeah, finding the right instrument is usually a um, long process. That's why it's, I think I got really lucky finding my instrument. I went to the violin shop and I played few violin and I was like, this one. Mm -hmm. um, the bow took me probably a couple months. I would, um, I called uh, different uh, shops, um, and they would send me in few bows for me to try. Then I would try um, play a different venue, the hall or small room at home, um, and play for our friends, colleagues. That's it. That's great. Um, so. How do you maintain an instrument? Do you, do you take it to somebody to look at? You said there's a crack in it. Does that need attention or making sure it? Um, yes, especially for how old my instrument is. Um, um, it also, it's so, just so dry where we are. Yeah. And once a year, 
there's always something like a, a little crack happening. The seam is open. So that's apparently a easy fix. So I just take my violin. If I think it doesn't sound right, I take it to the local shop and they will glue it together. <laughs> but <laughs> once a year I have to do it. Um, and then sometimes if I'm, um, and in the past I've gone to New York, to Chicago, uh, to have the instrument adjusted. Mm -hmm. It sounds a little strange, right? If you don't know what that means. I, I think I can, maybe it's like us getting a um, chiropractic appointment, you know, you can adjust it like that. And with use, uh, uh, you know, playing so much, you tighten your strings. So things get tension, get tight. Yeah, sure. So um, the professional violin makers or the shops that I go to, they are able to, they have magic hands. They're able to tap, tap, tap few places to release the tension. Then instruments immediately sound much better. And of course, we can't afford to go to New York all the time to just have your violin adjusted. And I have learned to do it at home mm. <laughs> for my own wow. instruments. It's like acupressure. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I realized I was started with uh, my students' instruments. <laughs> but then I, I also realized on my... Um, my experience of going to um, these big shops in New York, I realized they they have technique, but they rely on my ear. Mm -hmm. They ask me what I hear if I like it or not. So I realized if I can hear the difference, I can just play around with it. Um, so I watched some YouTube videos, talk to some um, colleagues that are more knowledgeable about adjusting instruments got some tools that's it so <laughs> just to make sure my my instrument's always in a good shape in good shape well it's it sounds wonderful that's fascinating actually um let's talk a little bit about music we have only were able to get through about two-thirds of this season unfortunately due to the pandemic but mm -hmm. there were some really monumental concerts this year um, maybe you want to reflect on, on, you know, a concert or a piece of music that was just really powerful for you. And, um, you know, and, and how also kind of think about how you switch between composers and styles, you know, how do you adjust and how do you prepare? Um, oh, let's talk about that first. Good. Um, switching between different composer and styles, because that's one of the hardest things to do as an orchestra player. And um, it's very tricky and it's something that we, we, get, we have to get trained for. Um, I remember when I, uh, before I got this job, when I was taking auditions and then you would practice orchestra excerpts all the time and um, um, and then now when I sometimes teach students who prepare for um, orchestra auditions, I will always tell them, you know, you play all the notes. But then, you know, think about if you're in finals, everybody play very well. Everybody is a good player and they all play all the notes. What makes you stand out is you're able to pull out different styles. Mozart should sound like Mozart, should not sound like Beethoven, but Beethoven should sound like angry Mozart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like different type of sound, which is really hard to do. Um, that's also something I really, really enjoy doing. As an orchestra mu musician, we're able to experience that every week. Um, and this season, I think we played didn't we play um, uh, Shostakovich five? 11. 11. I love playing Shostakovich with uh, Maestro Payari. Yeah. Um, he is just so, he's so artistic. 
and very expressive, very creative, very creative.、Um, and instead of telling us、um, playing louder, playing quieter, which is already on the music, but you know, if you're not, I don't know if. I feel like this is something only musicians understand. You can stop me, tell, correct me if、no. I'm not saying. Like I'm trying very hard to describe how this this feeling, what this feeling is.、Um, so you see on your sheet music says forte and piano, right? Or sometimes crescendo, decrescendo, and you do it. It's fine. Nothing is wrong. But Payare comes in and he tells you. What this should feel like, not looks or sounds like. He would say, "This feels like you're swimming in honey,"、mm. with his accent, swimming honey, <laughs> <laughs> swimming honey. Now we get it. I get it at least right away. I have this picture in my head. You're in. You're swimming. It's not that easy. You're in honey, but it's sweet and thick. Has that texture, so we get it right away. Or for Shostakovich, eleven, I think he described this feeling as、uh, <laughs> pulling your flesh off of the bone. That kind of pain. You don't need to tell us what kind of volume you play, right? He was aiming for the texture, texture of the sound. So I remember that piece with him. Yes. Yeah. It seemed like a long time ago. It feels like a long time ago. Yeah, a long time ago. It each week feels long. Each I have to ask what day it is most of the time. But、um, <laughs> that was an incredible series of performances. And speaking of different technique and style, Shostakovich to Beethoven. Shostakovich is now like like film music, like as you were saying. It, there's there's a story behind it as well, and、um, you all played that incredibly well. Yeah, I I miss、uh, working with、uh, Payare. He's just very inspiring,、um, and I also realize that he. Does I don't know if our audience noticed that he actually does things. Well, they wouldn't because they were not at the. They would not be at the rehearsals. So he does concerts differently than the rehearsals. He changes things. It could be the tempo, could be how he gives a cue.、Um, maybe he was just testing us. <laughs> <laughs>、um, see if we're paying attention, right?、Um, but it's that. Uh, that confidence that he has, right? First of all, I I do think music should not be all the same, right? There should be different ways to、um, tell your story.、Um, but the, the the way that he he's so confident he is, and he how he trusts us, he just know okay, they gonna they gonna come to to with me. It's just incredible.、Um, that's why every concert. I probably told you this, Martha.、Um, I was just so excited to share that feeling after one concert.、Um, it, every concert with him felt very satisfying and rewarding. Felt short. Felt short. Well, that <laughs> that short. says a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, we want to do this again. We want to play this again. I think that. As we were talking at the beginning, you are、um, someone who's studied with many people in many places, and I always like to think of an orchestra really as a laboratory. It's not、um, four rehearsals, three concerts done. It's progressive, and it, it it isn't that you have a teacher anymore. You have your, as you were saying earlier, you have your colleagues, and you have Raphael and guest conductors and guest soloists that、yes. you can. Respond to. Yes. Well, being here this orchestra for fourteen years, I have seen a lot of growth. It's definitely incredible. And for the the last five years, 
I think, been the most exciting. When did you come? I think since you came. <laughs> <laughs> It has been an exciting, uh, yes, I came in 2014, but it has been a really exciting time to see the, the um, energy and the commitment and the curiosity and the responsiveness of this orchestra. And everyone who works with you says that. Mm -hmm. um, it's just an incredible group of people and you, a group of musicians and, and humans. I mean, you, you know, humanity of this orchestra is always impressive to me. Um, and the caring for one another, which makes it really m even that much harder to be a part. But, um, so what else would you like these wonderful people who are, who are listening today to know about life as a musician? I mean, how does your, how does your music benefit from your, things, the other things you do in your life. I mean, it's, it's all focused on the music, I'm sure. You teach, you, but you're always preparing. But, you know, how, how does your world connection help influence that music? Make okay. This might be long. <laughs> I have to go back to my childhood a little bit. I didn't, I didn't choose the instrument. My dad did for me. I think he... He, he, because the fact that he was not able to continue um, his career, he really wanted to see this dream on me, right? Um, um, uh, sorry, uh, music, yes. So I actually, and he forced me a lot to practice all the time. I didn't, I hated it. As a child, you just want to play. Right. But in the very beginning of this uh, pandemic, um, the lockdown started, um, and I realized this is a gift. I, I knew that. I knew that playing, uh, being able to play instrument and have that uh, as your, your career, as your daily, part of your daily life, it's a gift. But you forget, right? You forget. So I realized, oh my gosh, what a gift my parents, my dad, give me, I can pick up my instrument anytime and just, you know, play some music. So I, I did text him. I told him, like, I'm really grateful for, for this. Yeah. Um, so I think that's the very fortunate thing for me. Um, and also, I want to say, being a musician, especially orchestra musician, what um, inspired what inspired me to be become an orchestra musician is actually audience, the oh, audience, yeah. and, and that has not changed since um, 1997 when I was a freshman at uh, at this, at Beijing, the Central um, Music. Um, conservatory when I was in the orchestra doing orchestra tour and then I loved how uh, passionate the audience I loved how um, well they received our message um, and that has not changed I really really I deeply miss performing for our um, our audience and our donors I know they are they are the reason why I'm here, really, like, I probably, I don't know all of you guys, but I know, um, I appreciate your support. Um, and my wonderful partners, <laughs> Bill and Sue Weber, they come every Saturday, and they sit in the same seats up on balcony. So I go out, I always try to find them, uh, like, let's see if I can find them today. <laughs> I, I see them, I will always wave, and they wave back. And I, I feel sometimes my husband comes to concerts and he wants to sit closer to me. Mm. So during the intermission, he can come up and say hi. He's like, I want people to see, look, I know musicians. <laughs> 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 These little things. And it always feel, make me feel, oh, 
I know my fans, my friends are here. I want to play better. Yeah. That, I don't know if that answered your question. Oh, I, it more than answered my question. That was profound. Thank you for sharing. It just feels very rewarding. Um, this is my language, right? And this is the language that I communicate with um, music lovers and then other people can't. And then it just feels re really uh, rewarding that it's received well and they appreciate that. Well, I think I can tell you from the people that I've talked to, and I know everybody who's listening right now, including Bill and Sue Weber, who are here with us, um, I can tell you that they miss the orchestra tremendously. And you know, it might be in the beginning we are going to continue in this virtual way, but when, when we can actually hear the music live again, it will just mean even more. Even think, more, for yeah. all of us. And, Absolutely. And we have not always had the opportunity to hear you share that feeling, so I always like to look for some silver lining in this, and, and your sharing that really was was. Um, was beautiful, but also I think meaningful to all of us who are who love to listen. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I have been um, practicing every day. Um, surprisingly, um, I kind of took this as a opportunity to um, step back, right? Like. Now I finally have all this time. What kind of musician I want to be? And I have been able to practice a lot of like solo stuff or just basic scales, um, finger exercises. And I feel like um, once I, I'm hoping um, we'll be back on stage soon and I want to be in my best shape possible when that happens. That's great. Thank you so much for being with us today and also just being so um, open with all of us. I know we have another piece of music to conclude. Do you want to tell us a little bit about it by Prokofiev? Yes. Um, well, this is a, a sonata for two violins by Prokofiev and Slow Modern's the first movement. Um, I played two parts and then it's recorded through a app called Acapella. So the uh, sound quality is not the best, but I had fun making the recording because it was actually really hard to play with myself. <laughs> um, you will see in the video, um, the first violin starts. Actually, I, I recorded second violin first because that's just somehow I figured that would be the easiest way to do it. And I was conducting myself. Yeah, so how the app works is that you uh, you just um, overlap two pieces. You record one part and you record another part on top of that. So it's kind of the timing was quite difficult, but um, uh, it was a learning process. I, I'm a little better now. This is some new things that we learned during this. Yes, absolutely. We're all learning new things. Jing, thank you so much for being with us and thank you for um, being here. It's been a great pleasure. Thank mm -hmm. you.